Hey everybody, Shane Presley here, Rock Paper Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to another brand new episode. Today's features my new friend, Patrick Baum. Patrick has uh, been a, has been around the St. Louis music scene for quite a while. You may recognize him as the voice of the Highway Companion and End World, a couple of bands uh, around town over the years, but uh, we get into some of his original solo stuff and some of the stories behind some of these songs and talk about a big old show he's got coming up on Saturday night, May 8th at Red Flag in St. Louis, Missouri with a couple of friends of mine, Ryan Chaney, Adam Gaffney, and Andrew Ryan. Grab those tickets today before they're gone. It's going to be an incredible evening over there. So, uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun catching up. It was my first time really getting to meet Patrick. I saw him at the... uh, Red Flag show opening for Ryan Chaney, and uh, that was my kind of reintroduction. I'd seen The Highway Companion years ago, and so it was just a lot of fun to get to sit down with the guy and talk about his uh, story, and it was a lot of fun. So I hope you dig this one. Do you want to remind you that Rock Paper Podcast is brought to you by Roughneck Beard Company and American Rambler, located right here in St. Louis. Over in the Maplewood area in um, off of Manchester. Swing by the shop or shop 24-7 at roughneckbeardcompany.com. Use my code RPP15 for an exclusive 15% off your purchase. That's uh, 15% off all your favorite beard oils, beard balms, your junk powder, or uh, one of their, my personal favorites, the Roughneck Beard Batter. Roughneck Beard Batter is the ultimate beard and skin moisturizer. It's a blend of eight nutrient-rich soft oils whipped directly into unrefined shea butter for a moisturizing kick like no other. The highest amount of triglycerides and fatty acids available on the beard care market, hands down. World-renowned, but made right here in St. Louis. Uh, And if you don't have a beard, American Rambler's got you taken care of for all your grooming needs. Uh, You can even get uh, combs and uh, all kinds of different things over there all uh, locally sourced and uh, a lot of wonderful smelling products and uh, whatever you're into, all your grooming needs, you can find it all at roughneckbeardcompany.com. And uh, also a big shout out to Heil Sound for their continued support and helping make this show sound great. Visit heilsound.com today and get yourself a brand new microphone. And if you uh, you want to reach out, uh, you can find me at uh, rockpaperpodcast.com. You can hit me up on email at rockpaperpodcast at gmail. And if you want to continue to support this show, a great way to do so would be visiting the merch store at buyjack.com slash rockpaperpodcast. We just added a bunch of new shirts, uh, tank tops, hats, all kinds of goodies over there. So visit the st- merch store and... Uh, Help uh, show some love. Let everybody know your favorite podcast in town. All right, that is it for me, everybody. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this brand new episode with my friend, Patrick Baum. Um, a podcast is kind of like a... It's like a radio show that's not on the radio. It's on It's on the internet. Does that make sense? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> that's also like my mom. <laughs> uh, it makes it sound more confusing, doesn't it? Uh, it sounds like this. This is Patrick William Baum, and you're listening to Rock Paper Podcast. Enjoy. Rock Paper Podcast. This is beat paper, paper covers rock. Rock beats is the shame, covers nonstop, never know what. New kind of guests that he's got coming at you. Live and direct on the spot could be rock, folk, country, or hip hop, jazz. All kind of folks. Could be an artist or a comedian to make you laugh on the Rock Paper Podcast. Double decker fudge round, rolling round town. Shane coming at you live and direct from ground zero. He's your hero, he's your bestie. Rock Paper Podcast with Shane Presley. Rock Paper Podcast. Hey everybody, Shane Presley here, Rock Paper Podcast, coming to you from St. Louis, Missouri, hanging out today with Patrick Baum. Welcome to the show, man. I'm really glad to be here, man. This is, I'm, I'm so pumped. I uh, So, I uh, 
I've kind of known of you for quite a while. I didn't realize necessarily how much I have known of you until we spoke uh, recently at the Red Flag show you were a part of with my good buddy Ryan Chaney. Uh, but th- that night, kind of put all the pieces together, I realized, like, oh, shit, I've been seeing Patrick play for quite a while. It's a testament to St. Louis, really. <laughs> yeah. you know, right. the small town aspect. Yeah. All right. Uh, <clears throat> but, like, I never knew your – I guess I never really knew your name as much. Like, we, it's kind of the crazy thing about St. Louis. Like, it is a – it's the biggest like small town kind of thing. Like we all kind of run in these different circles and stuff. And like I said, I've seen you play, uh, but like didn't really know you personally. And then like, it was, so it was kind of crazy how it all kind of come full circle that night and where it's like, Oh, all right. Now I'm kind of bringing it all together. But, uh, so I, uh, I know, uh, the highway companion I've seen, you guys opened up uh, several shows. I know one of them, I, I actually I typed it in like a Facebook uh, searching uh, through some of my photo albums I have and like uh, was one night with uh, Langhorn Slim at, uh, at Off Broadway. Yeah, I remember that show. Yeah. <clears throat> and then uh, and then you're a part of In World uh, currently uh, you get, and uh, which I know several of those guys from around St. Louis rock scene for years. So yep, yep. Uh, Again, I heard that music, but I didn't, you know, again, it's under the band name. I didn't realize that it was you and singing and stuff so until, again, all the all of it kind of clicked in place one day for me that night. So, But that night was awesome, man. That was a really a, a fun show, seeing you with Ryan and getting to uh, hear some of you just solo acoustic. And uh, you were telling some great stories that night. And I reached out and I said, after the show and I said, hey, man, I think you'd be perfect for – the podcast and you were like what's a podcast <laughs> you know like, what, like what's uh you know what so you said you never this is your first time right you said you never done a podcast yet yeah you know i got a, i got a lot of friends that that uh that enjoy them uh um uh, particularly my friend jeff uh listens to them all the time he's been recommending them to me for um months he's been sending listen to this one listen to this one you know and uh and then i'm like okay you know and then but i don't um it's something about like uh talking i feel like we're talking now and you're right across the table from me this is like a normal conversation i really like a normal conversation but uh for the most part i don't need dialogue you know um so podcasts are very new to me i'd rather listen to music um but I've been listening to rock paper podcast now that I knew that I was going to be on the show and I've really, really enjoyed some of the ones I've, I've actually listened to. Thanks so, man. Yeah. yeah. I, it's a ton of fun, man. Like I really enjoy it. Like it also like just like this, it allows me to get out and meeting new people all the time, getting to share their stories and songs and stuff. And so I just, uh, it's, it's a great networking tool. Yeah. Uh, and as much as Jeff wanted to be my gateway, Shane, yeah. you are my gateway. <laughs> you are my, my, the door open to podcasts. I do one to really understand. Yes. Yeah. Take that, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> Take that, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, I'm glad, man. I'm glad it worked out. I'm glad today. And I'm glad that you were digging the show. And, uh, I figured, uh, once we got going, I said, I'm sure all your friends have been on here. So, uh, yeah, I feel, I feel super selfish and like a kind of, uh, kind of like a douche, but you know, what I did was I definitely like scrolled, you know, every single podcast. Uh, I saw the Brian Venable one, obviously from Lucero and I was like, man, I gotta hear that. Um, but then I was like, Ooh, Marcus Newstead. Yeah. And then I was like, Ooh, Dan Joe Hanning. <laughs> and right. then I was like, Oh, Matt Wenzi, uh, from Mattahoochee, uh, uh, Joe, Joe Wenzi. Yeah. yeah. So it's been a while since I've actually seen or talked to him. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've known Joe for years. Yeah. Uh, so those are the ones where I was like, uh, man, I gotta, gotta fucking listen to this. Yeah, for sure, man. <laughs> um, but, uh, like I said, that night was, uh, so essentially my introduction to you, uh, even though I realized, like I said, there have been moments where we've been in the same room and stuff. So more uh, than we probably both realize, right? And that's what's kind of crazy. Like there's, I've, I've, and there's been, there's been actually a few times I put my foot right in my mouth. Sometimes where I've like got to tell him a story, and I'm like, yeah, there was a, you know, th- we were, I was at the show, and uh, there was this band, this band. I'm like, I can't think of that other band that was there. And like they're like, oh, we were that other band. I was like, oh shit, you know, like kind of thing. Like, a, but you realize that we were like. 10 years ago by, we realized like we didn't know each other then, but now we're all friends. Now we're in the same room, hanging out and become yeah. buddies and everything else. So, but 
it's just kind of a uh, weird how the world works like that where it all comes around we get to hang out and talk on a podcast and yeah get to know more about each other so uh but you uh i guess look let's kind of go back because like i said uh, if the, as, as this is our first time really getting to know each other like uh has it always been st louis for you born and raised in the area no i was born in uh i was born in connecticut uh and uh that was a long time ago i guess yeah. um, i'm pretty <laughs> old um uh parents got divorced when i was younger like in fifth grade and then i was kind of like a strange uh between two states uh mom went to the first the furthest she could without going to like asia uh she went to california and then uh, back and forth between california and new york i was kind of a problem child so um would get expelled and then go to dads and then get expelled and go to moms and alternative school and and so back and forth and i finally got my shit together halfway through high school and uh um i wanted to go to the arm i I wanted to be a marine like my father uh and i was talking to recruiters at the end of high school uh pretty much like the last i don't know six months um i think they were they were like stoked they're like they're like we're gonna fucking ship this guy off right to die um but uh i talked to my dad at the time we didn't have a great relationship uh, but we were talking when i was getting graduated from high, from high school he was a marine and so he was like uh no don't do it you know i got i got a good job why don't you fly out to st louis um, take, he, he took a job in St. Louis for Emerson electric, obviously a big St. Louis company. And he was like, if you just, uh, don't do the Marines and come out here, I'll help you out and get you an automobile. So I came here in 97 when I graduated high school. Well, there's my age. Uh, so, uh, in 97, I moved here, uh, got a, my, my dad helped me out and bought me a, helped me buy, I would say a Honda civic. And, uh, that's where I, that's where I ended up here. I've been here ever since. Uh, I loved it from the day I set foot here. Yeah. It's like a, it's sort of like, so California has got this like laid back sort of, you know, party and do what you want. And New York has got this go, 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 you know, pissed off sort of, if you, if you fuck with me, I'll, you know, I'll fuck with you back. And then, uh, there's like this weird Midwest sort of, we party, but we also don't tread on me, you know, kind of, duality to it and um i think going back and forth between those two kind of ideologies and whatever i've really liked it here so yeah i'm never gonna leave yeah (laughs) you're stuck you're stuck with me yeah i've been here all my life so this is really all i i know is uh so but i love it here and there's been you know i like visiting other places but nothing's really drawn me out to where i need to i feel like i need to go somewhere else but everything i everything i need right here like i love what we have going on in st louis the food the music and the, so uh i like it for sure it's a good city yeah it's a cool city uh it's an interesting city yeah man so uh what about music then when is, when um did either the, your parents play or anything like that when is this kind of no <laughs> well you know it's funny that we're sitting here at my kitchen table but uh um neither of my parents are musicians um although when i was younger um my brother uh really took to he w- really took to heavy metal um and i really i think that if if my brother hadn't had, had taken to heavy metal the way he did uh i probably wouldn't be here but we would when we were kids we would stay up i don't even know how we got permission or how they allowed it but uh we'd stay up till midnight every night on saturday and watch headbangers ball ricky rockman was like my idol back then i remember the premieres of all the the great videos the big four and and heavy metal my brother um was an aspiring guitarist and uh i mean he had the hair and the look and he wanted to be a heavy metal guitarist um that was kind of my intro to the whole thing um I think back in, I was so young though, you know, I was like in fifth, fourth, fifth grade, you know, and he's listening to Metallica and, and stuff. And, and, uh, you know, I'd watch that beggar's ball. I had different, you know, as, you know, things I liked and I was more, I think, you know, I was in fucking fifth grade, but I liked Def Leppard. Um, Guns and Roses came out around the same time and Appetite for Destruction was huge. Um, I definitely, I think at the time I was kind of more into the hair of rock stuff. Um, and I think, I think that that's kind of like permeated through my brother was really into thrash and I think Slayer and Megadeth and, and Anthrax, Metallica, all that stuff he was super into. 
and I was definitely leaning to more, towards more of the songs. Um, not that Metallica didn't have great songs, but, uh, but Def Leppard, uh, man, Hysteria, that record, uh, that was a life changer for me. Um, just hearing how well it was recorded, it was just so clean and crisp, and the songs were on incredible. Pour Some Sugar on Me and Hysteria, and, and those, that record was un- unreal. Mm-hmm. Mutt Lang, yeah. Shania Twain, fuck. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah. Um, which is funny, too, uh, I guess to, to say uh, one of the things uh, I think musically that really that changed me back then, this is when I was living in Connecticut. I was going to uh, New Fairfield like elementary school. I think I was in fifth grade. But what I would do is my brother, he would catch the bus, I think, earlier than I did because he was older. And then I would sneak into his room and grab one of his tapes. And, uh, you know, we were rich kids, so I had a Walkman. And that was, like, how, you know, you rode the bus. You right. pop your Walkman on, your headphones. Like, it's funny to even see wires coming off of your headphones oh, right yeah. now. Nowadays, it's like sure. your earbuds or whatever. But but uh, I remember uh, I remember uh, riding the bus every day, and I would, I would go into my brother's room, and it would be like, fuck, man, what's brutal? It's south of heaven or... Uh, Rain and Blood or Grab Master Puppets and these awesome thrash metal records from my brother's room. Um, even though I had Def Leppard, Hysteria, and Appetite for Destruction in my room, um, fucking Winger and whatever other bullshit that I was listening to back then. Um, but uh, I remember one day I got on the school bus. There was this kid named Nick, um, and I knew him. He was older than me, I think, because the, the middle school and the high school were uh, the same, they're connected or whatever. So the middle school kids were riding the same buses, the high school kids. So he was probably like a freshman or sophomore in high school, but I was still, you know, in fucking fifth or sixth grade. I don't even remember, but I remember I was always the last stop on the school bus trip. So every time I got on the bus, I would have to like sort of shimmy my way into a bus seat. It was always really uncomfortable because the bus was fucking full, but by the time they got me and then, by the time it, and then it got me and then we were off to school but this one fateful day uh there's this guy named nick who i you know had caught my eye he had this sort of like tony hawk swoopy haircut and uh and uh i always wanted to sit next to him on the bus because he looked really really cool and uh one day uh fateful day uh jump on the bus and the one open seat where it's like, like i don't have to be like the third person on a bus seat you know, back in the <laughs> right. day like safety i don't know if osho was around back then but they've been <laughs> like should definitely not pile kids into a bus that right. full um but uh yeah i saw this swoopy haired skateboarder kid named nick and there was an empty seat next to him so i sat next to him and so we were riding the bus together and uh i had my walkman and i was like doing my best to like and make sure that he saw that I had a Walkman and like I was listening to music too. And, and uh, he just like reached over and tapped on my Walkman and I kind of pulled my headphones off and he's like, what are you listening to? And I was listening to Metallica Master Puppets. And he was like, fucking A, man. You listening to fucking Metallica? And I was like, yeah. And this is way before Metallica had any um, whatever. And uh, he's like, let's trade. And I was like, man, it's my brother's tape. But this is so worth it. So he traded. He gave me his tape, gave him my tape. And he's like, uh, we'll switch back at the end of the day or whatever on the bus ride back or the next morning or whatever. And I was like, cool. Uh, and uh, so I basically rewound it, rewound hit the tape he gave me to side A track one. And I was like, I don't even know what it is, but it was Dead Kennedys. Uh, but I didn't listen to it, and I waited until I got home. And I got home, and I put it in my little boombox thing. Then it was, I don't remember the name of the record. It was like Holiday in Cambodia or whatever it was. But but side A, track one was Police Truck. Are you familiar with the Dead Kennedys? Uh, n- not not real uh, super familiar. Mm-hmm. But well, it changed my life. Yeah. And I I don't think I've really listened to Dead Kennedys since. I'm not really a huge fan, but. Police truck. That song changed my life immediately. Um, there's this line in it where 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 Jello Biafra, the singer, I don't even know if I pronounced that right. He says something about there's six of us, baby, sucking my dick and ride, ride on. And I remember just being like, whoa, people suck those. Like fuck, like this is it's insane. Uh, it blew my mind. I think I was in fifth fifth or sixth grade. Uh, it blew my mind. That was my first introduction to punk rock, and uh, I think. 
you know, my, I had this thrash metal older brother that was listening to Slayer and Metallic or whatever, and I'm over here listening to Def Leppard, and then I hear Dead Kennedys for the first time, and that was pretty much yeah. sold. Yeah. All in. <laughs> well, shout out to uh, Nick there, huh? Yeah, yeah. Nick Potkey. I, th- I think he was like Swedish or something. But super blonde, you know, he was that weird kid. You know, it's blonde hair, swoopy, completely straight hair, you know, shaved okay. on the sides. He was so cool. <laughs> he was so cool. Uh, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's crazy, though, like the, the music like that, like totally open up your mind to something. I mean, people, I don't, I feel like that's kind of a lost thing, like especially just diving into a record that they don't know, like, you know, just like. Hey, here, we're gonna we're gonna trade, and you're gonna you know listen to this for the day. And it's like it's just because everybody just I feel it's just kind of a lost art of listening to an album anymore. You know, it's just like everybody's all about the singles and stuff on the radio and different things. And an absolutely lost art. And yeah. I I will say one of the things that that we did, you know, not we, but but I remember doing um, not only with like you know doing it for your the girl that you liked or you know your buddy or whatever you put together a little mixtape you know you had the two cassette you know and you put together a mixtape and you know you try to show somebody you know hey this is like really really cool um i think uh playlists on spotify if you can share a playlist i mean mm-hmm. it's, it's a really cool way a lot of artists on Spotify now they do like a recommended or this is a playlist of stuff that inspires me or inspired that record or whatever. Right. I mean, I love that shit. I think it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. My, uh, I just had a conversation the other night with my uh, friends, uh, Hounds, and, uh, and and they've started essentially they they have their own podcast. It's uh, that they started as a band where they it's called In the Queue, and they just recommend records that they are listening to and stuff and talk about some of the songs and things. So it's like, it's fun to hear, especially if you're a super fan of a band and you find out what they're listening to, what these guys like to listen to. Like it's yeah. a, it's a cool thing to kind of deep dive into a bunch of unknown music to you. So one of the things I do, so I work from home. I, a lot of people do nowadays. Uh, I work from home and, and uh, I always thought that Tuesday was the day that new releases happen. I think maybe that was like a record industry thing that <laughs> Back right. in the day, I but, think yeah, I think it used to be. I do recall that. Yeah. Like it now, was, it's Friday, right? So records come out on Friday. I guess you know if you're on a label or whatever. But uh, one of my favorite activities on Friday is like, well, it's Friday, and I'm all, I'm just fucking working on five o'clock to you know have a cocktail and, and get done with the day. But uh, I love opening up. Uh, I frequent a website called Sputnik Music, and uh, they do reviews and. You can read people's opinions. Uh, people are, as a musician, I, it, it's so funny. So I, I know a couple of musicians that are like, oh, fucking critics and fuck critics. And how can you review music? It's art and stuff. And I really, I've always been a fan. I mean, Rolling Stone album reviews were like a thing that I, you know, I wanted to see what the the, the sure. cool asshole said about the <laughs> the new fucking whatever record. Uh, yeah, that was, um, that was always one of my favorite things to flip to the back uh, and find the, and the new release uh, and see some of the reviews. So I'm yeah. I'm similar with, with you. Like, it, not that our, their opinion always matter, but I just always and, and at least would re- like like to read it and yeah. compare, compare notes. And and then maybe you know, I like the idea that like even it. So I like the idea of. May turn me on to something that maybe I, you know, I haven't heard before, and and that and that's really for me is, uh, I mean, shit on a on a Friday morning you can hear some weird shit in this house because <laughs> everything on my computer is linked up with Spotify, so I'm like, okay, I've never heard of this artist before, but they just released a new record, and I'm gonna listen to it, and and really it's all about new music. You know, I, I got I hate to bring this up, and I'm calling out like like at least <clears throat> every single one of my friends right now, but. Everyone I know is still listening to the same fucking shit they fucking listened to in high school, the right. same fucking shit they listened to in college, yep. and they're fucking stuck on it. And <clears throat> I think it's really important in life to don't just like get your wheels stuck and then spin them. You know, like if you're a musician, you should, you know, you should branch out, listen to, listen to some fucking Mozart. Mm-hmm. You know, even if that sucks, uh, but give it a shot. Uh, and then when, someone recommends something to you even if it's horrible like poppy or nickelback or some you know something that you're not into no hate on nickelback or poppy uh but uh 
you know, give it a shot. Listen to it. Sit down. Do your best. Um, do your best for the artist. Do your best for yourself. Listen to music. Yeah. And I think that's important. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do list, I do have my favorites or things that I go to probably a lot more frequently than others, but like, I still love listening to nineties on nine in my car. And like, I love these, you know, things cause they are, it's a, a nostalgic kind of thing still, you know, it's just kind of go back and revisit some of these goofy, you know, songs and things that I grew up listening to and stuff like that. Uh, or put on, uh, I mean, just, uh, you know, uh, DMX passed and I put on, I went back and listened to DMX records and stuff. And like, so like, I didn't not, mean to do that actually. Not that I listened to, uh, you know, uh, a, a, you know, a ton all, all the time, but like, it's just, it, it was good to go back and like listen to old stuff again. But as much as I love the old stuff, I still love discovering new stuff all the time, which is why I still do this show. So, you know, it's funny. I got, so my best friend, Jeff is a tattoo artist and, uh, this is so random. Um, but, uh, I got tattooed by him a couple, two, three weeks ago, and uh, <clears throat> that's not my beer. <laughs> uh, a couple, of, <laughs> mine's already open. Uh, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, went and got tattooed by him, and uh, he works at this really cool shop right now. He's opening a, a new shop um, called Howdy. I don't know how much of. I don't know if it's a big a secret or whatever, but <laughs> if I'm a leaking special information, but <laughs> right now he's working at a place called Cousin Paul's. Uh, it's a really cool shop um, down off of uh, Hampton, uh, kind of near the Target down there in South City. And uh, this this woman is the owner of it, and she's so fucking cool. I believe her name is Laura. If I'm wrong, I that sucks if I'm wrong that her name isn't Laura, but she's really, really cool. And... Uh, she's usually there when I'm getting tattooed and uh, it, it's so interesting. I kind of know Jeff's tastes and it, it, when you go to get tattooed, typically the tattoo artist puts on music every once in a while, the tattoo artist is like really cool. And you, I know you're in pain right now and I'm hurting you. What would you like to listen to? And that, that's always kind of like a nice uh, thing uh, that someone could do. Um, but uh, I remember this last time I got tattooed, she was, uh, Jeff had played something and it was really interesting. It was called uh, pink martini. It was like this strange jazz, interesting uh, band where everything was like in a different language. Like all of a sudden there's one song and it was in Spanish and the next song is in fucking, you know, and there's different singers and it's like this weird lounge jazz. It was really, really cool. And then uh, she went to go, the owner of the shop uh, went to go put on something <laughs> and then she put on Too Short. Uh, the, the this he's a rapper, and I, yeah. I grew up on Too Short. Right. Um, and I lived in California for a, a period of time. Um, but uh, she put it on, I think, mistakenly, uh, thinking that it was uh, uh, like a uh, an album that was like a, all of his stuff over the years. Uh, but Too Short actually just recently put out like a new record called The Vault. Um, even though it's not like the vault, like all of his old shit or like remastered, like all of his best songs, it's not like a best of, this is actually a two short record he just put out. And so I'm sitting there listening to it and I'm like, man, it's like classic fucking two short. It's great. Although it's not as, you know, porn centric, centric as <laughs> like <laughs> classic two short may have been. Um, but it was great. And I was listening to it. I was like, man, this is like. I've never heard any of these two short songs. And, it, and I, and she said it was like a compilation, but I think she was mistaken. She put it on thinking it was like going to be all these old two short songs, but instead it was just like this new two short record. And I remember listening to it and being like, Holy shit, two shorts, like putting out the same fucking shit and it's awesome. And like, he's got something to say and it was great. And I, I enjoyed every second of it. Aside from the fact that I was uh, in constant pain, right. it was awful. Yeah. Yeah, I recommend getting tattooed while you listen to this record. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, too short. Uh. Yeah, man. Uh, speaking of second on things, uh, earlier uh, <laughs> blow blowjob Betty. Blowjob uh, Betty. That's a classic. Such a good one. Classic cocktails was one of my yeah. favorites. Yeah, I mean, he talks about all the uh, different females he's been with. <laughs> right. God. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, I I I love old hip hop like that, man. Like. Yeah. Uh, I talk about uh, before, but like one of my early memories, uh, you know, kind of 
my Nick, I would probably say would be my cousin. Jeff introduced me to a lot of records. Uh, he a couple years older than I was and he got his license and we started cruising around in his car mm -hmm. and I started listening to a lot of different music because prior to that, it was mostly what my parents were listening to. So, uh, you know, and I had a couple of things I liked that I you know, picked up on the radio or whatever, but I started listening to all sorts of different things. That's why I first heard, uh, like Pink Floyd, the wall and, you know, stuff. He had these cassettes and, uh, and one of, one of the other ones was, uh, was easy. -E. And easy, uh, man. Yeah, easy and, does it. And I, so, uh, and I remember that was one of my first, uh, CDs that I went and like bought myself. I got a couple bucks and I, I went to flea, the flea market and I browsing through this and I found, uh, easy -E straight off the motherfucking streets of Compton. <laughs> And uh, I'm like, you know, whatever, 12 or something, whatever it was. And I was like, I bought this record from this guy at the flea market. And I just thought it was funny that he sold some kid this re record and stuff. But uh, Life fucking changing. Oh, yeah. yeah That'll, an easy -E record at that age? Holy right. shit. So I, uh, luckily, my parents were like super cool about all that stuff. They, really? They, I mean, I, they, well, I don't, they didn't really pay that much attention to what I was actually, actually listening to, but they weren't trying to censor any of it or anything like that they were they were both hippies from the 70s so like they were you know all about it but that's uh, cool yeah that's cool you know it's funny i i, I respect them i i've always been that's a, that's a, one of those things i've always been on the fence uh of is whether or not you should censor i mean obviously I'm, as a musician i don't think you should censor someone from listening to anything they want to and these days i mean shit how do you hide uh, my buddy craig uh, he's on a mission to hide or, or figure out a way to censor what his children can, can get. Mm -hmm. Um, and it feels me, it, it seems to me like a never ending process of frustration. I mean, how do you hide, um, the dark web and the awfulness and, and, and stuff. But, you know, I think NWA, Easy -E, Ice Cube and, and, uh, Too Short, all that stuff. I mean, it was a learn. It, it taught me. Mm -hmm. a lot um maybe it's it's best that you just let them yeah i, I, don't, I don't know i don't know that uh, yeah we're neither of us are parents so. right yeah who knows what the, <laughs> the right answer is but i mean i think we turned out all right i mean like you know i don't know that i'm think. i yeah. think nwa helped me yeah i think still to this day right i'm I mean, a better person it, it's Everyone is. I think it opens your mind to a whole different world. I mean, I, I didn't live that, but like I lived it through these records, like listening to that, hearing their stories and stuff. So like, yeah, you know, so, um, but yeah, man, well, we've been, uh, talking a lot about other music. Well, let's talk about some of your music. Uh, I, uh, so let's start with, we talked about, uh, the Highway Companion I mentioned that name earlier. Uh, it was a project you were part of and uh, sang in for and stuff and songwriter. And uh, we did a live take on a on a Highway Companion tune uh, here today in your at your house and a song called Damage.
myself Sitting around here drinking whiskey by myself You're born, you get tortured Could have gone is beautiful, but you left me here in hell instead. And my heart can't break again. You took that away from me way back when. This is uh, this sounded really good, man. This was a uh, cool to, to. I love this stuff. Like I love just uh, stripped down acoustic versions of this stuff, and like how I imagine this is how like it started. You know, just you plucking away on a guitar and kind of coming up with uh, some of these. You know, the the bare bones of the, some of these songs and stuff. So like it's so when I get to record these moments like this, it's kind of like it's just a lot of fun for me as a fan of songwriting and stuff. So. But uh, what do you uh, what do you want to add around uh, this particular tune? Uh, I don't know. It's been a long time since I wrote it. Yeah, and that was probably back in uh, the two thousand teens. Um, just about getting over the heartache. Yeah. Stupid. Was this the one you were you were saying something? I remember I, you played this at that Red Flag show, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's. I mean. I, I I definitely I would say that it's one of my better better pieces of songwriting. So mm. typically, if I'm if I pick up an acoustic guitar, I'm gonna probably play it. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful song, man. And like I, uh, but it was uh, there was something you were you were talking about, like you were in like a was this the one you were with the talent show thing you were part of? Oh yeah, I, yeah. You were telling that story, <laughs> like I thought it was interesting. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I think it's funny just recently so we're 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 practicing for this fucking uh we got the show in on in may we'll talk about it but but um i didn't realize i've been playing it uh with cape on the fourth fret um now for i don't even know how long um and i'm having problems hitting the big high note at the end uh and then we show up for practice like fucking two nights ago and craig's like uh no you're, you're this is the whole thing's a half step down and i'm like no, it's not. I've been playing this for years. <laughs> Don't come in here and tell me about my song. Uh, and turns out, yeah, it's a th- it's a third fret capo. Uh, so then I, you know, after after that practice, I go into my room, grab my guitar. Uh, you know, Brian's over there laughing at me, and I put it a third fret capo. I'm like, yeah, that's the way the song's supposed to be played fuck i've been playing it wrong for years and i've been having problems because I'm, I'm getting older and i can't hit these high notes i fucking can't hit the fucking note anymore then i put it on the third fret and i'm like boom <laughs> hit the note perfect every time uh uh so yeah uh i'm sorry what was the question uh you, you were telling us st- uh, a story about a, oh, a yeah. talent show at the, at the talent the, show yeah so yeah i was working at at uh uh I think I was I was managing restaurants. I was bartending for way too long, and then decided I was going to manage restaurants. and And uh, then I uh, got a job. Um, this wonderful woman named Andrea Palmer, who is a you know, famous Applebee's uh, employee, uh, she opened like forty fucking Applebee's stores. She's an amazing woman. Um, she gave me a job at River City Casino, 
she had taken the job there to basically manage the entire south side of the casino, which is basically like five outlets, and it was Burger Brothers and fucking all you know all the restaurants down there on the south side. The not buffet side of the casino. And so that I entered into this world of, uh, of casino life. And it's, it's very odd when you work for this, like a corporation, a company where there's hundreds of employees, um, you've got a cafeteria, you know, and, and, and you're seeing people, you're walking these long hallways and there's hundreds of employees and it, it's different. Um, just a, a different kind of uh, situation. But I had, uh, you know, 50, 75 employees uh, between all of the different restaurants on the, the south side of that casino. And uh, I remember showing up one morning and as a manager, you show up, you t- sit down at your computer, you open up your email and then you print out all these fucking things and you get ready to pre-shift all your employees. And it's basically just like, you know, you got 20 servers for lunch and then you got, you know, 20 for dinner and you got to let them know all the specials and you got to let them know all the things that are going on. And you tell them all about the things on site, by the way, your health insurance and this and that and blah, blah, blah. So you pre shift them. So this one morning I opened up my email and it was the talent show. So I, I was like, man, that's cool. I didn't know my fucking, you know, casino had a talent show, but it was casino only. Like it had nothing to do with like guests it was just the employees. Um, so I printed out the the flyer and then went into my pre-shift with all my my team members uh, that morning. And I, I went into my, my lunch pre-shift, my breakfast pre-shift, then lunch pre-shift. And I think I was still probably there for the dinner pre-shift. And I basically told them all, every single person that worked uh, on the south side, I was like, you need to bring your A game. Come on, fucking talent show. you know. And I think at that point, I didn't really know I was even able to sign up for it i i wasn't going i didn't want to um but i think i talked so much shit about how they needed to bring their a game and join the talent show you know because i'm like weird (laughs) you know a pre-shift for me is like fuck let's fucking rule the world today you know it's like i'm like this weird motivation motivational speaker that should just shut his mouth (laughs) Well, I showed up to work. The, the following day, I showed up to work, and then all of a sudden, my boss, this horrible woman named Melissa, um, and I hope she's fucking listening, fucking sucks. Uh, <laughs> Melissa uh, goes, so are you stoked about doing the talent show? And I was like, what? So basically, I got signed up for it. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm doing the talent show now. And then I even... In, in a, a conversation with her, I told her, I, I have no interest in doing this. I'm not, I don't do battle of the bands and talent shows, which has come up over time or whatever. But she said, well, you're going to let down all, all the employees that you talked all this shit to, you know, so you have to do it now. Wink, wink. What a bitch. And uh, <laughs> so I ended up doing it. Uh, I played a... Uh, a song by one of my favorite artists, this guy named David Ramirez, who's out of uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, he's a great dude. I booked him a bunch of times at Cicero's when I was working there. And uh, he had a, he did an EP. I think it was probably, he was trying to get a, the label support. And it's called Strange Towns, like five song EP. Uh, and uh, f- five great songs. I mean, that guy should be ruling the world at this point. It's amazing that we talked earlier before we got on sure. uh, recording these artists that you just can't understand how they're not Tom Petty or Elton John. David Ramirez is in, in my eyes is one of the greatest songwriters of all time. No one knows who he is. It's a shame, but I played a David Ramirez song for this fucking talent show. And I worked a fucking like 14 hour shift before I got on the stage. So I did breakfast shift at Louis nines and fucking, was fucking th- bussing tables and yelling at servers and fucking restaurant managing for like fucking ever from like 5 a.m. to like 5 p.m. And then I had to fucking take my fucking suit off and then run into this stupid, you know, what events, event center thing and then, and then play a David Ramirez song, throw my acoustic guitar and run up there and DI in, and, you know. Um, the funny thing is the sound guy at River City at the time, uh, he's... He, he's a St. Louis guy, uh, his drummer. I wonder if he was the guy. Either way. Um, but uh ended up playing this David Ramirez song uh, for this talent show and uh, played it. 
and I had like this whole weird corner of the seating in front of me where all the servers of all the restaurants that, uh, that I managed and they were all cheering and it was super cute. Um, so I won, um, and, uh, which is really funny. Um, I didn't even play my own song. <laughs> so when you win the talent show, then they, then they send you to, uh, black Hawk. It was like a week in black Hawk, Colorado. Um, which is this amazing mountain town. They got casinos up there. It's like the wild, wild west kind of really cool. So they flew me up there. My girlfriend at the time, we're on the plane flying up there to Colorado and, uh, we're chit chatting about it. And, uh, and I, I kept saying, I was like, it's really going to piss me off to win this thing playing a David Ramirez. I'm like, fuck that guy. I'm way better than him. (laughs) Uh, I love Dave. Uh, but uh, I said, I think I'm going to play uh, uh, an original for the, for the final show, you know, you know, where all the winners of all the casino talent shows in the company, it was like Maristar, all the Maristar. I don't remember. It was Pin- Pinnacle Entertainment, I think, was the company that owned all the. So I was like, fuck it. I'm throwing out David Ramirez. I'm not going to play his song. I'm going to play my own song, which was Damage. And I played it at the uh, in Blackhawk, Colorado for the uh, company-wide Pinnacle Entertainment talent show and fucking lost. I think badly. I don't, I don't even think I played it that well because I hadn't really rehearsed it. You know, I'd been playing the David Ramirez song. Um, so I lost. And the guy who won... no. The guy who I thought should have won was this really talented keyboard player who played uh, um, Billy Sheehan, the red-haired kid with the tattoos. Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran. Yeah. He, he, with a big Ed Sheeran song. Was a, yeah. Whatever the big Ed Sheeran was. He played it on a keyboard, and he sang wonderfully. He was amazing. But uh, they apparently the the casino company had the, this like weird um, Vegas... They didn't have a casino in Vegas, but that was where their like like corporate office was, and they did this weird fucking like m- medley of um, of like three songs. Um, it was like a Maroon Five song, and then Journey, and then it sucked, and they <laughs> they won. And I just felt at that point I was like, this whole thing's rigged. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm a sore loser. Uh, <laughs> that's why I should. I, musical competitions are fucking stupid, yeah. and that's why I would never sign up for a fucking talent show. I thought the whole thing was fucking stupid, anyways. I felt like it, it was like American Idol or the fucking Voice, and don't get me started on that shit. But I, I think art is art, and I, I think it should just be enjoyed or not enjoyed. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's funny. Though. Like, I mean, uh, at least it's uh, at least you got the trip to. Colorado out of it. It was a great vacation yeah. for the most part. Yeah, yeah, man. I wish I had better company. <laughs> but uh um yeah. Yeah. Well that uh uh it's a shame that they didn't uh they... Would I have won the first round though if I had played my own song? I don't know, man. That's that's an interesting uh thing something to think about. I don't play with what ifs. Yeah. But that's one that still right. lingers. For sure. I uh yeah, it's just uh uh, it wasn't really a great movie, but like uh, that that like butterfly effect kind of thing, you know. Like yeah. if you could go back to that one moment and change that thing, like what would happen? And like I don't know. There's definitely like some of those things to think about in life sometimes. Like if you would have gone left instead of right or whatever. But hmm. it's kind of weird to think about. But yeah, maybe could we maybe not we maybe we wouldn't be having this conversation. You Too difficult for my tiny brain to even yeah. fathom. <laughs> you, you maybe you would have uh, met, been on some. Uh, crazy tour bus right now right. somewhere on yeah. too, way too big to be doing a rock for podcast right now so you, too big never yeah. <laughs> never uh but uh that's uh it's a great song man and another uh great one i really uh that uh really resonated with me this week uh as i was prepping for this i went to uh patrickbaum.bandcamp.com uh, which is where you, the hub for all your, uh, solo music now, which, uh, you, you, uh, so anybody that wants to follow along can head over there and grab some of these songs, but there's a song on there called all that you need, uh, that you also performed live 
acoustic here for me today on the show. And uh, this one just, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a romantic at heart. So this is one that really like uh, got me. And like, I don't know, this almost feels like uh, could be like somebody's wedding vows or kind of thing, you know, something like that. Like it just like it really like uh, the lyrics, uh, I feel pull from a, that kind of moment, you know, like we're just kind of laying it all out there. Like this is you, this is what I want to be, uh, you know, yeah. I want to be a better man and stuff like, so I want good songs. Yeah. It spawned from good inspiration. For yeah, sure. But that's, so that's where my mind went and that kind of just like that kind of sentiment and stuff though, for sure. Like, but You know, I will say uh, the the band camp. Uh, you know, I've always been uh, uh, not a good sharer. Uh, this is new for me. What we're doing right now. Is, yeah. Um, maybe uh, maybe I I, sh- I overshare or something like if you it, you know you get me a few drinks in me and you know, we're hanging out. Yeah, I'll, I share, but for the most part, um, I don't like to celebrate myself um with others maybe i could do it on my own um yeah i mean sometimes but the, i don't know the whole thing it feels like masturbation and <laughs> it's not something i would like to do publicly um so <laughs> i think uh i've always I've, I've, i had a really hard time it is frowned um, upon yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> right let me see Kay. uh 
Um, it's it's been one of those things. that's Been hard for me. So when do you when do you decide something's finished, um, and then release it to the world and say, there you know world uh, have at it. You know, I think with music it was always you know what you hand it off to the producer and then you send it off to get it mastered and and then you're like full fine it's fucking done and uh, you know. I'm doing it by myself and I've always been doing it by myself for years and years and years. Uh, so when you write a song, you know, where do you put it? Um, that's why I brought up uh, Misha Mansour and, and he's got this, uh, he's in this band called Periphery. He's, he was always called the bulb and he would uh, write all this music and it was all this throwaway stuff that he, you know, maybe he had. So he just basically started his Spotify and he's got like dropped like, eight albums worth of all this material that he's basically been, been, been writing or whatever. And um, I've never really, it's not material that I'm you know, trying to sell or that's finished or that was mixed and mastered and mastered. And we sent it to fucking Alan douches or whatever that guy's name is. And, and the whole thing got fucking done and we're promoting it or whatever. I just, I write songs. Where do I put it? It's either in the fucking dumpster or in a hard drive or whatever. So what do I do with it? So in the beginning, it was like, okay, well, here's STL Punk. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you might oh, yeah. be, you remember STL sure. Punk. So, so I was like, okay, well, I wrote this stupid fucking song with a drum machine and acoustic guitar. So I'm going to put it on STL Punk. So I put it there. Um, then STL Punk kind of did its thing. Uh, MySpace uh, absolutely murdered everything and right. so all of a sudden it was like okay well i'll put it on myspace so i put it on myspace uh so then myspace you know and then pure, pure volume came out and i was like well i'll put my music there too and, and uh and then i think just over the years it was just like where do i put this stuff you right. know and uh i've never really been i don't want to release it i want full control and i i feel like uh once i give it away and put it on Spotify and then it's streaming and stuff. It, it, there's a finality to it where you can't change it. Mm-hmm. And uh, that bothers me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't know, man. In uh, camp, I can just throw it up there and yeah. it is what it is. Well, I'm glad at least, uh, that it's there, you know, that it's something that you're sharing these songs and not, they're not just sitting in a hard drive somewhere or whatever. So, um, because as I, we, as we talked before, if, if you're into it, Reach out to me. Yeah. <laughs> All you got to do is, you know, ask around, get my email address. I'll send you, uh, we'll Google Drive, we'll, we'll link up and I'll send you so many songs. Your, your fucking hard drive will be fucking full of Patrick, <laughs> Patrick fucking bomb. I got uh, so much shit. I love that. Like, I mean, I do, you know, I, especially this song, it's just the simplicity of it. Just like I said, this, I like just vocals and a, an acoustic guitar, a, song, a tr- true singer songwriter type of stuff and and that where the lyrics you know are heartfelt and you feel it in that you know you don't need a big crazy production like you're saying they don't it doesn't need to have all this producer on it and everything else to make all these things like it just it is perfect as it is as like it is you know just with it just that so uh so i like that and i like that a lot of your the stuff on there is just you, you know, it's very, very uh, minimalist approach to a lot of it. Some of them are, some have a little bit more pr- production on them, but, uh, but for the most part, it's just sometimes I try to get fancy. Yeah. But I, it's just so I, I'm glad that there's at least a hub for these songs to live there for now. Yeah. And, uh, so um, that's what it is. Right. It's a landing, a landing spot for yeah, the time. Man. But maybe one, uh, maybe one day, you know, we'll get around to putting out a, record or something with put all these songs together and put that available for somebody I don't yeah know. i mean yeah once if, if gabe usury is listening uh he recorded the highway companion records uh you know i'd love to you know have someone mix it and make it all kind of sit in the right spot and yeah and then put he, it out you know he's but, uh he's a bad dude man I, I love gabe he's a very talented man gabe is an absolute saint you know um yeah he uh I, and Jenny, you know, both of them. Yeah. Great people. For sure. So, uh, but yeah, I would love to make that happen someday. Hopefully, uh, we'll sooner than later get a, put the put all this together for a nice Patrick bomb record. Uh, but you hopefully do- it's like fucking like, uh, like then I, so I die 
And then I, like, I'll, I'll write a will and then be like, okay, you're in charge. And then you got to put it all out. And then I'd rather people enjoy it when I'm gone. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's like, I, I kind of, I think about some of that too, even with just the show. Like I don't necessarily, I like, I love doing the show. I like recording, but I do think about that moment. Like it, when I'm gone, that all this stuff lives on well after I'm gone, you know, it sits like, in there. Yeah. yeah. And like, I do think about like, you know, again, I don't have children now, but the, if the someday that, that I do have children and like, I'm, I say something happens to me before I, you know, get to teach them all these things. Like at least they can kind of go back and revisit some of these recordings and discover who I am and everything else and learn along the way and stuff too. So yeah. Uh, kind of my, my legacy legacy. Yeah, man. I mean, that's you bring up a, yeah, you know, I think that's an interesting. So, so why do you do it, Shane? Why do you, why do you keep asking questions and why do you keep doing your podcast? And why do I keep writing songs right. and why do, I mean, why do I pick, why does someone pick up a guitar? I know a lot of guys, you know, pick up a guitar and you want to play a solo. Uh, why do you pick up a song and want to write a song? Uh, why do you want to catch Pokemon? Uh, I mean, it's, there's like this weird collector. Um, what can I leave behind legacy body of work? Right. And I think, I think that's where you and I probably are, are, are very similar. I think that it's, it's very important. Um, am I trying to write the perfect song? Is that exist? I mean, no. Right. Um, but how many can I, can I make that are, you know, okay. Sure. And I think, uh, I think that's also a good approach to it. That is that to, to just write it and let it go because like so many people, I feel like it just gets overworked, overproduced. It takes away from whatever that moment, that raw inspiration and it just beats it to death to where like it doesn't have any feeling left anymore and stuff. And like, yeah. and that's what I respond to that song is like, it is that there's, you know, emotion into it and stuff. So I don't know. There's, there, I always go back to like, I'm a huge uh, fan of Will Hogue. Uh, and he's just <laughs> super, super prolific uh, songwriter. I'm familiar. Oh, yeah. yeah. But like, my he, buddy Nate gave me a lot of shit about Will Hogue back in the day. Oh, yeah. Well, I like, I mean, uh, I've listened to a bunch of your podcasts. I've listened to the country artists that have been on sure. there, and, and everyone hates on new country, and they're like, "Oh, it sounds like rap now." And, <laughs> right? Oh, it's you know, and and uh, I country music is country music, man. And uh, when Eli Young Band uh, did their version uh, of that that Hoag song, yeah. uh, I like Eli Young Band's version. It's it, polished. It sure. sounds great, and and uh, there's nothing wrong with it, but. It sounds pretty, but it doesn't. I don't. I not moved the same way I am when I listen to the Will version. The Will version. It it doesn't have that feeling to me anymore. It like takes what because Will but, Will wrote the song like or well, and, yeah. well, with Eric Pasley. But so, so let me ask you this. But, it, 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 honest opinion here, and 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 I know that this is devil's advocate, right? So uh, let's say I wrote a song called uh, what was the fucking song we we were just talking about? Um, all that you need. All that you need. Yeah. So I wrote a song called All You Need in 2021, and uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, some fucking douchebag that's like half rapping and half whatever on the fucking country radio. He's fucking got you know he's beautiful and he sings like a fucking bird, you know, Billy fucking Currington or whatever. And he's like, he he hits me up and he's like, man, we really want to cover that song because it's really well written. And then I get to hear that song sung by an absolute angel of a man or woman uh, with an absolute perfect production uh, in a perfect Nashville studio with all the best producers and the, the best of the best. I mean, isn't that like, you know, as a cook, like you're, you know, the sure. recipe that you came up with and yeah. then you get the best chef in the world to like Absolutely. cook up your recipe and then you get to eat it. Like I know this, this whole will, I've, I've had this will argument with, with, uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not knocking. Even I, if it breaks your heart oh, yeah. a million times. And I just, uh, well, there's a lot of like, d- doesn't mean I have to like it though. <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you can, I mean, you can make the best thing with like 
sometimes I, I still feel like there's things like that. Like I'll go to restaurants, you got the fanciest things. Like it doesn't, doesn't matter. I still enjoy just a, you know, barbecue or whatever or something, you know, it's like whatever. It just doesn't, I don't need, uh, this over, you know, this big fancy thing on it. So. Well, I would love to hear one of my songs done. I mean, well. agree. I agree. <laughs> I, I think as a musician, like that's like the highest compliment that somebody wants to like cover your song. Yeah. I was like, make, I'm waiting. Yeah, man. So cover my song. Right. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, years ago, I, uh, I was, I, for a period of time, I sold wine, uh, and, uh, went to a, a wine tasting. Um, and, uh, it was like this, it was weird German wines. It was like it was somewhere where I shouldn't have been, you know, back in those days, I mean, I was like in my twenties and I was drinking whiskey and going to punk rock shows. I mean, there's no reason I needed to be at this thing, but I worked at, I was selling wine for world market. It's my first job out of college. And, uh, Took my girlfriend at the time. We showed up in t-shirts, you know, like this, and fucking, we we're walking. It turns out it's fucking like damn near black tie, and everyone's fancy, and it's this huge. And everyone's spitting into buckets. It was ludicrous, dude. Right. Then there's cheese table and Ludic- all this Ludicrous stuff. was there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, anyways, we ended up going to the wine tasting. We, we were like cruising around. We're doing like shots of rieslings and and uh, gewurz demeanors and whatever. And and uh, we ended up sidling up to the corner and we were basically just trying to get drunk as fast as we can and get the fuck out of there and the the rep the wine rep guy uh i'll never forget him Kenyon martin um came up to me and uh he was like wow you guys are underdressed but he didn't tell me that it, this thing was fucking fancy a fucking asshole um <laughs> he's the reason i saw the parents paris hilton uh uh tape <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day, uh, he brought it to me, burned it. He, I think he was handing it out to everybody. Oh, man, I got the Paris Hilton tape. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he came over and, and, and uh, he thought he was, he, I think he wanted, he thought it was really cool that he would invite these like, you know, punk rock, you know, kids to this fucking wine tasting. Well, anyways, he introduce, introduces us to the sommelier who's, uh, who's English, but was working for a, for this German winery and German wines are crazy. There's a million different ones all the way up to the, you know, all through the thing and the rivers and the regions and all this bullshit. And they're all white wines in Sweden, semi-sweet and annoying anyways. Um, but the sommelier comes over to us and he's like, man, you guys are cool. You know, like, uh, what are you guys doing here? And I was like, well, I work for world market. <laughs> And uh, Kenyon tricked me to coming here, but we're enjoying the free drinks and delicious cheese. And uh, he goes, uh, you know, so we started chatting or whatever. And uh, and he, I asked him what he did for a living, and he said he was a sommelier, and uh, which is basically uh, a strange title for someone who recommends All right. a wine. <laughs> and uh, I remember he told me. This is a sommelier. What the maybe school? I don't know if there's a sommelier fucking school or whatever. But he told me that uh, his job was completely pointless, and he had like he was doing it, but it was total bullshit. It was a smokescreen, and I was like, "Really? What do you mean?" And he was like, "Well, you know, you got this, you know, girlfriend with you, and you know, you guys, you know, cook." you know, spam and eggs, um, and then open a bottle of yellowtail Shiraz, you know, $5 bottle of wine, uh, but you're in love and, uh, the mood's right. And you're listening to the music that you love and you're looking at this woman that you love. And all of a sudden this $5 bottle of wine tastes like is the best wine you could in the spam, you know, it's, it's great. Or you could go, to, you know, and spend, you know, $500 at some fancy French bistro, buy the best wine on the menu that the sommelier recommends um, only to find out that maybe you have a cold that day or you're coming down with something and all of a sudden everything tastes like shit. <laughs> right. So really it's, you know, do what you love, do it with the people that you love. And yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, there's a lot to be said about that. Like I actually, there was a, there was a great thing uh, that surfaced after I mentioned uh, DMX and there was a great, picture i saw on uh it was that uh it was actually like he played himself in this show on abc i forget the name of the show now but he he made a guest appearance on a show and then in, in the scene he's uh has a raising or he's growing orchids 
And he like uh, he said when uh, when I first started growing orchids, I thought that I needed to have the most expensive soil and the most expensive lights. And then I was like, then I realized all they need is was time and attention. Like I saw that this morning too. Yeah. yeah. It's great. So I was just, like, there's a lot to be said about that. Like you don't need the most expensive shit. You just need time and attention. Time and attention. Yeah, so I remember when it's dark and hell is hot came out, uh, on Def Jam and I'm a huge DMX. I mean, I, maybe I, I was back in the day, a big DMX fan. Um, he was kind of like the second coming of Onyx. Um, but uh, when It's Dark and Hell is Hot came out on Def Jam, um, the special edition had a, had a, a, a Def Jam, um, like a, it was like a CD sampler, whatever. And the last track on it was an LL Cool J song called The Ripper Strikes Back, um, which was his uh, response to Cannabis. Um, another rapper back in, in the nineties that like beefed with LL Cool J and the Ripper for all those that are listening right now, if you're hip hop fans, if you haven't heard LL Cool J, the Ripper strikes back, um, please look it up. It is one of the greatest, um, like beef tracks ever. Yeah. I recommend it. Check it out. Yeah, the Ripper yeah. strikes back. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if I know that one about Eminem and 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 Machine Gun Kelly. <laughs> who gives a shit? But LL Cool J and and Cannabis. Holy shit! That was yeah. some that was some, some shots fired, man. Yeah, yeah. man. <laughs> uh, well, we kind of touched on it earlier, but you do have a, a live date on the calendar. Which, uh, if anybody remembers live music, um, you you're gonna want to come out to this one because it's. Uh, we had a lot of fun at that last Red Flag show, man. That was a, it was cool. Again, like I said, you and uh, Ryan Cheney and Ryan played with a uh, full band. And but this time, you guys are gonna swap roles. You're gonna play with a full band and close out the show. And Ryan's uh, gonna be opening. Uh, and also added on the bill is uh, good buddies of mine, Adam Gaffney and Andrew Ryan. So all incredible songwriters. Gonna be a fun night. Over at Red Flag, May 8th. Tickets available right now. And uh, come on out and join us over there. It's a beautiful space, man. That was my first time in there to, when I saw you play. and like My first time, too. Yeah, I was really uh, really impressed with uh, everything. Like the, it's just, It was really cool just to be in there and like see. Uh, that's one of my favorite things when I do go to a new venue, just kind of like walk around, kind of taking it all in. and um, But, yeah, I like it a lot. Yeah, the storage containers. And yeah. The- Bob did a great job. Yeah. yeah. What a great dude. And, uh, it, it's such a shame that COVID happened when it happened. Cause uh, you know, he was, I mean, red flag would have been, you know, they, they would have been rocking and rolling, oh, yeah. you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, they had a lot lined up and then everything, everything just yeah. calendar wiped clean, wiped clean. Yep. But, uh, I mean that I get, maybe that gave him more time to make it as perfect as he, as he wanted. Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously you like the cash flow and the, and the revenue coming in, but, um, I'm, I couldn't be more proud of the people that, uh, in St. Louis that, uh, are, are doing stuff. And, and Bob is just such an inspiration. Uh, and Chris, uh, gotta love Chris too. He's, he's run there and he's been a, a, a big supporter and he's the reason why these Ryan Cheney shows. Well, I, I even played the first one and, I can't even imagine that uh, the Ryan Cheney and his band were so fucking good. Um, that show we just played with them, uh, they were incredible. I mean, I was getting emotional just the first time I heard that kick drum. Mm-hmm. It was just like, man, I missed I missed that. And mm-hmm. uh, they were so good, so uh, they were so tight and practiced. Um, it was just an honor to to play. So being that you know we could do it again, and, you know, and then I can try to get my buddies to 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 play with me. Um, so it's you, an honor. You got, you're bringing along, uh, the, the fellows of in world, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I think at this, I don't know. I think at this point, everyone's, you know, you're just a musician in St. Louis. Uh, um, so Jeff Meyer, uh, one of my oldest and best friends, uh, he's been a bassist, uh, and he's a, an artist and musician in his own right. Um, uh, he'll, he'll be playing bass, um, that is if there isn't some crazy meltdown before it now and, and May 8th. But uh, we practiced. We only, we're only going to rehearse a couple times, uh, I think three times total. Um, and hopefully we can, you know, get all the 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 
wrinkles ironed out, yeah. which is fine. I think we practiced uh, two nights ago, and uh, it was pretty easy, touch and go. I mean, these are simple songs that I, I write and play. Sure. Um, and these guys are all pros? What? Yeah, I mean, fuck. It's almost like... Uh, it's almost like trying to get somebody that's like like ten million times the musician for the music to like ask him to be like, can you just be stupid for a minute? And <laughs> my buddy, uh, just play this three times in a row, you know. I just uh, have my talking to my buddy uh, Anthony, and he's he's working on a new country. Uh, record a couple of songs, and for and he uh, reached out to uh, a guy, um, blanking on his name now, but he recorded with like alan jackson and joe diffie and whatever all these like 90s country he's like 14 time guitarist country music of the year kind of thing or whatever yeah. so he's like legit pro you know whatever the the guy uh for a guitar and he's like and he you know he's asking him like uh when they, when they arranged it he's like you know do, what do you, do you want me to do this so he's like like you're the you're the guy. Like I I hired you to you know come lay, play lead on this track or whatever. Like you do what you do. Like I'm not gonna try to tell you how to play my you know. Yeah. It's like and then uh, so it was just like, but you know it's just like uh, funny to think of it like just uh, just you guys are pros, man. Do you know what to do? Like you just do what you do and bring what you bring to the song and stuff. And so, well, you know, I I find it interesting too, and and I I, I so. All right, so it's Jeff, Alex, and Craig, right? So Craig, Craig has been in, uh, you know, kind of uh, post-hardcore kind of emo, screamo kind of stuff. Uh, Ava Waite, uh, The Leopard. Um, uh, he's been in some uh, notable St. Louis bands. Alex has been in uh, uh, Monster East Manhattan. Um, he's fucking fantastic. I mean, he's hey. such a good drummer. Jeff, uh, we've been in bands together, but he was he's been, he was in a fucking these are now even drowning, uh, um, open hand, um, a dare. Uh, so, you know, asking these guys to be like, Oh, can you just take some time out of, out of your schedule and, and play like ba- kind of badly, not badly, uh, <laughs> kind of country, kind of, it's very, very simple stuff. Um, um, it's 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 a it's a boon you know it's it's very very cool yeah um be like asking you know fucking it's asking someone super super fucking talented that can play fucking anything to hey just play three chords right and just do it over and over again for this entire song i know it seems (laughs) weird but you know and and even that first practice jeff's like you know he's looking around for maybe i can play this note and do all this stuff because you know he's He's bored immediately, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah. you know, that's you know, simple music sometimes is okay. Yeah, man. Well, you uh, mentioned all these guys. So you do have you have End World out there. You guys have yep. uh, what? I got three three EPs, right? Is that the is it the last one? The current one is that considered an EP? I, I mean, I guess it's like an it's like a it's I don't know. I get I would call it an EP. An EP, yeah. yeah. So we we basically we did um I would I, would, I think it was it, it was my doing so we had, we we had recorded we had written eight songs but the first four I mean this is classic classic Patrick Baum uh, we had written four songs the first four songs we we recorded and written as a band um, and then we wrote then we wrote four other songs but for some reason they had an arc so that they were like a you know. It was a concept, you know, every, all, all the four songs. So I was like, I really believe that these four songs are like kind of on their own because all of them kind of follow this story, but these songs are just kind of like songs. So I was like, let's split them up and we'll do two EPs instead of one full length because it would be, I kept thinking it would be really weird to, you know, I don't know, put a full length out with like four songs that are clearly, you know, back to back. And then these other four songs that didn't fit in. Yeah. Um, so I think I ended up making them, everybody split them into two, which I think cost us more money on CD baby, <laughs> whatever. Um, well, I think that's a good way to go though. I think like, a, I feel like that's sort of like the m- momentum shift in music is like people getting away from the albums. Uh, you know, there's definitely still people putting out albums, but like as far as like being uh, consumer friendly, uh, here's four songs for get you by for a while. 
and hit them with a second one, uh, you know, a couple months later yeah. or whatever. That way, like, it, it's more, less, hey, here's 12 songs that you listen to today, you know, and then and then, and then we'll see you in a year or two or whatever. You know, it's like, it just is a lot more like keeping a fan base involved and uh, yeah. longer and stuff, you know, keeping their attention span. Yeah, I, I, you know, I got problems with that. I, it, it's it's definitely, a, you know, I got this inner fucking monologue, but, you know, I'm an album guy, you know, right. I want to buy the record and I want to live with it, you sure. know, and I want to force myself to, to really dive in. I, you know, I, I see a lot of artists these days where it's, you know, you, you know, they're putting out one song and then one song, mm-hmm. one song, one song. Um, uh, there's a the, the kind of a modern, I don't know, a hard rock band that I, I, I follow called Spirit Box. And a uh, uh, woman named Courtney, Courtney LaPlante, the singer, uh, they're fantastic. They're a great uh, modern rock band. Um, but they kind of just, you know, one song at a time. And, and uh, they put out like a, an EP and it was kind of like they just released five singles and then they put out a five song EP of the five singles, Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of what I'm doing in my own right with my own songs. You know, I just, I finished doing it and I put it out and I finished doing it and put it out, you know? Um, but there's something about, uh, you know, a body of work and, and, um, and maybe it's just this old school mentality that I need to kind of just shed and get into this whole, you know, write a single and put it out, write yeah. a single, put it out. You know, but there's, it's two sides to everything, you know. Sure. Um, I love- I've, I've always wanted to put out a, a record. I want to be on vinyl, yeah. you know, I'm old school. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm with you. I, I love that, too. Like, uh, But at the same, at the same uh, I'm also a fan and, like, you could drop a big old record and then like, I'm going to be like, okay, cool. When's the next one coming out? And it's like, you know, just yeah. because like, I always want more. And so like, I feel like that's also the nice thing about the EPs. Like you can get it more frequently uh, or something like that. You know, if you do split it up, even though it's, it could be one big project, but we're going to space it out in six, every six months or something, you know, whatever it is. But again, there are no rules to any of this stuff. Yeah. But like, but that's kind of the, what's, but the definitely the the business has changed a a, a ton, a ton. Uh, so nobody's really there are just still bands doing it, but just not as much anymore They're putting out full link records and stuff unless you're like the foo fighters or whatever you know yeah. or something like that like I even think too of covid's kind of and uh you know if we've talked about this uh are you f- familiar with bill Murray uh, not the actor but the <laughs> it's, the musical <laughs> I don't know if I know that. Musical. Yeah, so it's this guy. He was in Attack Attack, um, but he basically is like a, he's like a, he's got his own studio at his mm-hmm. house, and he, he he's just constantly writing. Or just like Misha, Misha Mansour from from Periphery, these are guys that are super fucking talented. They're great songwriters. They're fucking shredders on guitar, um, and they just put music out because they literally have a studio in their house, and they just just pumping it out and know where to put it. So, um, and I brought up Misha earlier and, and, uh, this guy from Bill Murray, I can't remember his name right off the top of my head. Um, but he puts out like an album a year. I mean, it's just constant material. Um, and really done. I mean, if you like that kind of shit, uh, uh, (laughs) it's done well, but it's this, it's that whole body of work where he just keeps pumping shit out. And, uh, whether or not uh, something Frank is his name, something Frank. Either way, um, <laughs> but uh, but that, that's the thing. Like, I think I'm one of those guys. You know, like um, with End World, I'd really like to to get together, fucking once a week, twice a week, write songs, do it as a group, um, come up with a theme. Um, come up with art and do the whole thing, you know, front to back, and make it a, a, a gorgeous uh, release and album, right? But uh, my own shit, you know, it's just you know, just you get on the toilet and poop, and <laughs> you eat more food, and you get on the toilet and poop. Uh, circle of life. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about a tune called "Bread Crumbing." There it is. The stupidest title of uh, the song. <laughs> That uh, this is off EP two, yep, yep. Uh, released in twenty nineteen. Uh, currently available wherever you get in your digital music at, uh, right? Yeah, I think yeah. it's everywhere. So check that out. Uh, but this is uh, what do you? What would you like to uh, add around this particular 
tune. A uh, period of time I was working at Lumiere Casino as a beverage manager. I had a bartender named Cindy. Uh, and Cindy one night said, uh, have you heard about this thing breadcrumbing? And I was like, what? She was like, yeah, breadcrumbing. It's like what you do when you're like, uh, uh, like online or whatever, when you're like texting, you know, you like leave breadcrumbs for someone to keep them coming back to texting you, um, to try to like, you don't actually like commit to like an actual like online date or like you don't actually commit to like meeting up, but you keep leaving these breadcrumbs to keep that person coming back. Uh, to you. And I, I thought that that was like this weird, manipulative, awful thing. And I was like, man, that would never even cross, you know, my desk. (laughs) Uh, but apparently it's, it's across your desk. All right. Um, so I looked it up, uh, but, uh, I think to me it meant more like, uh, you know, you, you lead people in a certain direction and that end world EP, um, if you listen to it is uh, not the, the brightest, happiest piece of of art (laughs) um but uh i was the whole point was leading someone down a maybe a road that they maybe didn't want to walk down and uh, i was breadcrumbing the listeners there you go
I, lo- I dig it, man. It, it was, I mean, all, all the stuff you guys have out there really well done. Um, I, uh, it was kind of fun too, like to, you know, you, you've done a lot of different things musically. Um, but it was cool to hear more of this, this approach to rock music more with like more, um, melodic and, uh, kind of different things going on with the music and stuff. So, uh, I, and, the, and the band, all those guys you mentioned, they're all killer players. So like it's some, killer. some really, uh, really good stuff on the music. And so, um, but yeah, man, I'm really digging it. Hopefully we'll get in world on a stage somewhere soon. Uh, Hope soon. and COVID has been really tough. Sure. Yeah. Which was like, I mean, obviously, uh, the latest, uh, you guys did release uh, in 2020, uh, really sick three songs there so oh yeah yeah yeah. we did uh you know we had two that were kind of written that were just kind of hanging in there white knight and uh, uh cape cod uh and cape cod was kind of like a a rehash of an old mccree song a band that i was in uh years back um th- this idea this experience that i went through um and uh then i remixed one of the songs from uh ep2 uh, called Descent, which is one of the slower songs, just to challenge myself. Uh, I do like a lot of le- electronic music, and uh, <clears throat> I thought it'd be fun to just take, because I, I recorded the vocals on my own, um, even though it was produced by uh, uh, this guy, I'm spacing on his name right now, um, which I feel horrible about, but uh, I recorded all the vocals for EP2 on my own and then sent them over to him and then he mixed them. Um, but uh, since I had all the vocals for Descent, all the harmonies, everything just sitting in, in, in the DAW, I was like, well, fuck, I'll just put some fancy beats over it. And so I did a remix of that song. Nice. So it's really two new N-World songs and then one remix. Yeah. Right on, man. Well, again, and you can find N-World on your Facebook and Instagram. Uh, get plugged in for more information. Um, but hey, I've been, uh, I got a couple questions for you uh, that I, uh, these are submitted from fan submitted questions <laughs> for you. And uh, some of these made me laugh, and I'm sure there's probably going to be uh, some stories to go with some of these. A <clears throat> uh, uh, d- uh, friend of the show and a former uh, bandmate, Dan Johanning, wrote in. Uh, When's the last time he fired up some Mickey Don Bows? I don't know if that's. I'm sure that's a. I mean, I'm a pretty insider. Yeah, thing. dude, I fire up the Mickey Don Bows all the time. Yeah, it's delicious. <laughs> yeah. Um, these days, uh, I mean, the Big Mac is obviously my favorite uh, item on the menu, but I like a, a cheeseburger. It's weird. Uh, the pickle is always the. I never know whether or not I want a pickle on my cheeseburger or Big right. Mac until I am in the drive-through, and then I have to decide. Yeah, but yeah, man, if you're feeling pickle or not that day. Yeah, that day. Right. I mean, I literally have my pickle choices in the drive-through every single time. I don't hate. I love pickles, but right. for some reason I can't decide whether or not I want them on my burger or off my burger until I'm in my car. Yeah, in the drive-through. <laughs> yeah, you should just have like a. Pickle coin. No, you know, <laughs> what, am, what am I feeling today? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bald Eagle Mountain <laughs> writes in. I don't know who was running there. That's fucking Adam their, Bar. Yeah, I figure it was Adam. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who was actually actually running the account, but uh, wrote in. Uh, That's Adam Bar all day. I read that this yeah. morning. Yeah. What happened after that David Allen Co gig? Uh, <sighs> who ate the production intern's <laughs> dinner? I, I, honestly, so. Uh, really good friend, uh, Jake Snyder. Um, at the time we were, man, uh, such a talented, hardworking, uh, amazing individual. We were at the time we took on booking, um, shows at Cicero's. We both worked at Cicero's back in the day. Uh, it was pretty clear to me after about like hour one that booking, uh, and being a promoter of shows or anything besides, playing guitar and singing was way beyond my depth, but Jake was really good at it. And, uh, I was in the highway companion at the time we were country band and, uh, somehow Jake is a fucking magical human being figured out a way to book David Allen co at, in Alton, Illinois at this like fucking, I don't know, like recreation center or something like a fucking, like a hall. Mm-hmm. 
I, I mean, and he did it. I mean, this is just Jake. I mean, there's he had no. I mean, he's. I would never have the balls to book David Allen Coe in the middle of fucking nowhere, in the middle of whatever. But Jake did it and asked Highway Companion to to open the show. So, of course, this is probably aside from Chuck Berry. I mean, that was probably Highway Companion's biggest show, and it was all Jake Snyder um, that did it for us. Um, but it was scary, man. Like there was like biker gangs right. and fucking it was crazy dude and then he's so old david allen co is so old and it, it, the whole day was crazy um and i think that we were you know all the highway companion guys so the deloys and i gotta mention uh jake and josh deloy um old old friends of mine um uh were the, the we had the core of of highway companion uh such great people um, and then Adam Barr, um, who's Bald Eagle, I think yeah. that's the Bald Eagle Mountain. Uh, uh, he played keyboards for uh, for Highway Companion. Yeah, Dan obviously was our guitarist. Um, but big, uh, big fan of Adam Barr. Yeah, yeah. and he's. In, I mean, you talk about some overlooked, overlooked, supreme fucking talent uh, musician in St. Louis. Um, overlooked, uh, incredible body of work. Yeah, man. Um, but uh, he, uh, we, so we, we were playing this show, and I think that all of us kind of took to the bottle um, pretty quick because we were, we were, what are we doing here? Why is David Allen Coe in this weird, <laughs> I mean, it's like a fucking weird, it's like a VFW hall right. or something? And Jake had the whole thing. I mean, he was fucking calm as a, you know, okay. he was fine with the whole thing. But, you know, I'm over there sitting, I'm watching David Allen Coe fucking uh, line check and stuff, and I'm like, Get, what am I doing here? Um, but anyways, uh, we all got way too drunk. Um, it was kind of a pretty common theme back in those days with the, with our band. Um, but we got shit faced, and and Jake had this intern that was working for him, or I don't even know. He was this like young kid. I should fucking totally remember this more but i mean those were some dark days <laughs> boy those were some dark days but yeah he uh i guess we we told him we needed food and uh he said well i'll, we'll, I'll go to mcdonald's for you guys and so we gave him this gigantic order it was like <laughs> like 20 fucking you know 20 piece chicken mcnuggets and like six big macs and like 18 cheeseburgers it was ginormous um and then i think like someone's I don't know. Once we get to the hotel room, it was complete chaos. But it, someone sat on the nuggets and, <laughs> and there was sweet and sour sauce everywhere. And we were, everyone was so intoxicated. It was a great time. Yeah. Good. I don't remember much. So, yeah, uh, to answer that question, <laughs> uh, not sure. Yeah. Uh, we got uh, another one. Uh, what? Uh, I think it was at uh, Huberto. Is that all right? From Matahoochee? I don't know. Right? What's that? From, uh, is it here, uh, Herbert, Herberto? How do you say his name? Let me see. Do you know him? Roberto Moreno, yeah, world's dude. okayest bassist. Do you know him? <laughs> uh, well, I'm sure I do. Yeah. Uh, he, he wrote in asking, "What do you miss most about working at Cicero's?" <laughs> uh, that's. Uh, I remember him. I don't remember his name off the top of my head. Um, what I miss most about working at Cicero's? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It, it, you know, it's super funny. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's like a, a restaurant thing or, you know, whatever. But, uh, I mean, I have friendships. Um, I have friendships that, that that I can't even believe that I still have um, as a result of... I mean, I'm going to the uh, auto show tomorrow with my buddy, uh, my best friend Joe, um, who I know because of Cicero's. And uh, shit, uh, I mean, we just went over to... Uh, our buddy Craig's house the other night and uh, playing cards and having beers. And uh, <laughs> the two people at the table um, that weren't us, um, 
they knew Craig because Craig had a, this job at TGI Fridays right. 20 years before, you know? Like, uh, so, you know, Cicero is, is a, a strange thing is an amalgam of these human beings that come together. And, uh, you know, you just, it's like family, you know, you experience so much and so much fucking horrible shit and sure. great shit and, and getting drunk and having a great time. <laughs> it, you know, there's people that are, that are in your life, regardless of whether or not you really want them to be or not. <laughs> right. Um, uh, you watch Superstore at all? I ha- I know of the show, yeah. but I haven't seen it. But I'm sure it's the well. So it's based in like a Walmart. You know, it's called Cloud Nine, but that's is what it is. It's ripping off a Walmart, but I can't use the name. So, uh, <laughs> but and what I think is really great is it's based in St. Louis. This the store that they work at. So no shit. Bo- yeah, on the show. So there's all sorts of great. Uh, not necessarily local references, but they do mention like surrounding cities. So when they usually they they're all real city. So it, it, it's funny they'll say something whatever like you know something you know like uh, the Valley Park Walmart or a Cloud Nine or whatever you know something like that. Like you know they'll really they drop in names around the, of different cities uh, around uh, the St. Louis uh, chapter one. So gives me more incentive to watch. It's, it. It's really a great show. It's really funny. But there's a so it just came to an end uh, after six seasons, and uh, so. What you're saying is what I really felt like going through the, end, the last couple of episodes is like where they're really like, they're, so the store closes. That's they're 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 shutting down the store. So that's the whole thing is like it's, it's let alone the series is coming to an end, but the whole stores they're shutting down that their store. So yeah, so they're all saying kind of goodbye to their friends, and it's like it's that whole moment where you're like these people mean so much to me, even though it's not a great job necessarily. Uh, being here, you know, like it's, it's, it's working retail or whatever, or, you know, uh, working in a restaurant and things, it's, but it's like, it's, uh, there, we went through so much life together in and out of that restaurant or store or whatever. And, and, uh, those people are a part of your life. Like I said, you know, you're never going to forget these people and stuff. Yeah. So it's like, so that's what made that, that ending was like really like quite emotional, you know, like, I mean, and I can think about as you're talking about that too, like I was thinking about my friends that I've made over the years just through, you know jobs and stuff like this yeah. so like um but yeah man it's you know it stinks that uh but uh you know we all kind of go different directions and things and do our own things but uh yeah you know, you know I, some of the greatest i mean i one of the greatest friendships of my entire life is is because of cicero's uh, right. and a lot of the experiences even even as a musician so you know i worked there for 10 years i mean that's a fucking long sure that's a long time to work any job i mean it's like career type of shit mm-hmm. um you know bar backing bar tending or working a door it's insane that you would be somewhere so long doing something like that but right. you know um i did and uh some of the greatest uh some of the greatest experiences and and uh people marcus newstead brian cologne uh liz baldez uh I mean, fucking Daryl. I mean, I mean, dozens upon dozens. Uh, Joe Wicks, uh, Brian Worley. I mean, just dozens upon dozens of people. Um, fantastic human beings that I that I met. Um, Andrea Furness, man. Like, I mean, I, I could go on for for hours. Sure. Um, uh, Adrian Sandusky. Uh, people that are just amazing human beings um, that are off doing. 10 million times better things, you know, than, than, than maybe just working that job. Um, but it, it, I tell you, I left before Cicero's closed. Um, so I had moved on and, you know, I was trying to manage restaurants. So that was a fucking great idea. Um, but I had moved on and then, uh, you know, Cicero's, it, you know, it, it kind of did its own thing. I remember my buddy Dave DeGuire, who's now uh, down in Texas. Uh, he actually worked there for a, a hot second after you know I had left, but uh, it wasn't the same, I guess. And and uh, you know, yeah. when it closed down, it, it I still if I go to the Loop for whatever reason, if I go to a, I remember I went and saw Meshuga there at the pageant, and I went and stopped by, and and Dave. I kind of had a couple of beers with Dave when he was bartending at Cicero's, even though I didn't work there anymore. It was fucking super weird, but I don't know. Yeah. A lot of good people. Yeah. Matahuchi. For sure. A lot of. Joe Winzy, uh, the swag, um, uh, Laura, Playback STL. I mean, there's some amazing, some amazing bands played in that venue. Right. Yeah, man. A lot of good nights over there for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Pat. Rick, this has been a lot of fun, man. I really uh, 
glad we did this today. Uh, I'm glad you shared some of these stories, some songs, and um, I can't wait to see this uh, show again May 8th at uh, Red Flag. But uh, I'd love to, uh, I mean, if there's like, I feel like we barely scratched the surface. There's so much more <laughs> stories there to dig out. Uh, but uh, I, I would love to do this again sometime, man. Yeah. For sure. So Just let me know. I appreciate you. Uh, doing this today though this was a lot of fun getting to hang with you and getting to officially properly uh, meet you and getting to hang out so my first podcast we experience. did it man that's it we did it it's pretty easy i was worried I ain't none to it i was fucking stressed out man i know it's like a, i'm writing notes over here you know <laughs> Just, fucking yeah we got we'll dig into some of those notes i think on part two but uh <laughs> Maybe, yeah, yeah i don't know <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, ain't none to it man just dude, sleeping dogs lie just, uh, okay. just some dudes hanging out so <laughs> Cool, man. But uh, yeah, this is uh, again come out May 8th. Red flag, Patrick Baum, Ryan Cheney, Adam Gaffney, and uh, Andrew Ryan. Uh, can't fucking be, wait. Yeah, it's gonna be a good night, man. We're gonna fucking rock. Let's do it. Yeah. I can't I, wait to rock again, man. Yeah. Uh, that's what that's when I was sitting in that room. I saw, I was like, man, I like this is all right, you know, this is cool. Hunter Cap, limited space, you know, everybody seated at tables and shit, but like. I can't wait for that room to be, Thanks, baby. you know, hot and sweaty with a bunch, of, you know, people in the dancing around and stuff. Like that's why I can't wait to get back to that. So I mean, before before we finish up here, I want to ask you this question. All right, um, I think this is a good question, and I I posed it to others. Um, but COVID nineteen, where we are in the world, will the mosh pit ever be a thing again? Are oh. we? Do- is the world done moshing? I, I think those that mosh, uh, <laughs> the, the, definitely, <laughs> definitely threw up the yeah. those that mosh. I think uh, I think they'll be back there. I, I think there's definitely going to be people that uh, are don't you know aren't going to want anything to do with it, or you know just even having are people are going to have anxiety just going to public events of that size of, you know, anything like that in general. Yeah. Right. It's, it's totally going to change the way people view things. So listening, and, listening to Dan Johanning talk on I th- the wilderness uh, podcast I listened to with great interest. He was talking about, man, I can't wait until I fucking get back into a venue and everyone's sweating and <laughs> right. hugging. I mean, this is hot water music yeah, It's a hot water show or bouncing souls, you know, like, you grab the guy that's next to you. You have no idea who they are, right. but you're sweating and you're fucking singing the same fucking song and you're you're going to town. Fuck my shoes. They're going to be <laughs> awful after this thing. Right. You know, um, can that can that exist? I, I, I think so. I think like I said those that there's the people that are really into that kind of thing, that world. They're going to I think they're going to go right back. Into, I mean, once things are, you know, a we get to that point and stuff where it's allowed or whatever, but you know, but I think there's, it's going to, it's definitely changed everything, but I don't think it's ever going to take it away. I think people, once, once we're allowed to I imagine everybody's going to get right back into it and like realize, Oh yeah, I, I love this. Uh, this is, I remember being so. a kid standing at the edge of the pit, you know, at a hate breed show, poison the well show and being like, man, those guys in there, they're swinging. They're looking pretty crazy. They're pretty scary. Right. You know, do I want to get in there? You know, maybe I got in there. Maybe I didn't. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> now right. I think about standing at the edge of the pit, not getting punched in the face by Jason Tierney. But, sure. uh, you know, now I s- think about it. So I'm standing at the edge of the pit. And I'm at a show. And I go, well, I don't know if I want to get in there. Cause yeah. I'm going to get sick. Right. It's just That's a, what I'm saying. Like, I think everybody's going to have that in the back. There's, there's definitely going to be those people that think about that stuff but getting punched right no big deal <laughs> yeah, right. do i want to be sick for a fucking month yeah, uh, sure moshing i don't know right it's crazy yeah i agree i is i mean unfortunately you know, like even after we get vaccines and everything else out there like it's still going to be a thought and think you know whatever it's yeah. just it's going to totally change everything well i bought tickets so. for gojira and deftones in september I don't know if I'm getting in the pit, but yeah. I'm fucking. I'm, I'm ready for some fucking see, rock. See, I yeah. don't get in the pit for other reasons. I just don't want to get punched in the face. Well, yeah, that so sucks. I, yeah, and I, <laughs> I'm 36 now. I don't want to. You know, I pay for it a lot longer now. You know, it's like than I used to. So, yeah. uh, and I'm more like some of these shows are just so, so damn loud. Where I'm like, I'd rather be in the back of the room where I'm not blowing out my ears the whole. You know, the whole time. So, yeah. uh, 
but at that age, man. at the same time, at the same time, I, like, I, I can't wait to get back into, you know, like it's, I still love that stuff. So we'll, we'll see, man. Yeah. There's we'll a lot, see. lot to be figured out still, but it's uh, definitely never going to be the same. So, yeah. But yeah, man. Well, thank you, Patrick. Thank you for having me, man. Thanks for the uh, cold refreshments. And uh, I appreciate you uh, doing this, buddy. But uh, that's a wrap. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Rock Paper Podcast. Rock Paper Podcast. Rock Paper Podcast. Rock Paper Podcast. Well, yeah, that was it.